So good afternoon, everyone. What a gorgeous day. Welcome. I'm Giovanni Singleton, uh, Lunch Poems Coordinator. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and uh, we also would like to thank the University Library for hosting this event here in the beautiful Morrison Library. Uh, I invite you all to sign up on our email list, um, which is over on the librarian's desk. We also have uh, some posters outlining uh, the rest of this year's events. So please stop by and pick one up. Um, you can also view on our website this uh, event probably in another week, along with our previous events at lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. Um, and we have our own, our very own YouTube channel, so please do check it out um, and link to it. Uh, next month on November 2nd, we will have, uh, we will welcome Salma Sh Sharif, who uh, actually graduated from UC Berkeley, so we'll be welcoming her back. And now please welcome Lunch Poems director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce today's stellar reader. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, Lely Long Soldier was just shortlisted for the National Book Award a couple days ago or yesterday? Two days ago? Okay. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, and um, has in other years won things like the Lannan Foundation Fellowship and a Whiting Award. So people have been recognizing the work for quite a while. Um, I have as well. I've been teaching from the poems in this book before it was a book. Um, they're incredible poems. Um, I want to start by just asking a question that I think the poems in this book set themselves to answering, which is, how do you write in a language that has waged war on the, your very category of person, both historically and in some ways materially in your own um, present embodied life and time? Um, but a language in which you're also capable of phrasing joy and connection and making inventive form, but a language that has materially and linguistically dispossessed you. Um, I think there are many answers to that question, many strategies that the book employs. You, you write back, you make counter histories that reveal all the violence inside the dry letter of the law. Um, you make sport of legal language. You divide English into its legalese and a language that would be more capable of supporting connection and feeling. Um, you turn legalese against itself into that language of thought and feeling. Um, and throughout, you try and make sites where language gathers rather than being dispersed and into which maybe a language besides English can be temporarily, partially, intermittently invited. Which is also to say that I think this book is very much about place, but not only place as a site of mourning dispossession, but also as a place of regathering and consolidating and standing ground, being a linguistic protector. Um, and one of the ways it does that is by reoccupation of that dry yet violent legal language. So the book is called Whereas, and of course we know whereas as a kind of legal preamble term, which can repeat again and again, almost like a poetic refrain, except what it'll gather under that refrain is usually not a very good thing. But whereas also contains within it where, it contains place, but it contains place under an as condition. Right? a hypothetical or virtual condition or a condition that requires speaking it into being again and again. In Lely Long Soldier's hands, whereas shifts from being the site of legal violence to being the site of poetic resistance and feeling and an erasure of erasure. Please welcome Lely Long Soldier. Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Giovanni and Jeffrey. Thank you so much for the invitation. It really is an honor to be here with all of you. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, I'll just say briefly, Leili Akichita Hanskai Machiapi. 
Daya hipi na chante washte na be chiyusapi. I'm very happy. Uh, I come here with, in my language I said, I come here with a good heart and a warm hand or something like that. <laughs> I've been thinking about a, a lot of, it is true that in this book, uh, I am working with, uh, I am taking apart some of this <clears throat> language that uh, works to, um, I would say, um, at this point, it defines a lot that happens in our communities, tribal communities, and restricts a lot of what we can do. But I think also in this book, uh, I hope readers can step into a world of a place of belonging as well. Uh, and I think that there's some of that in there. It is not always, uh, the work is not defined by resistance, um, but there's also a place of belonging that I like to enter. And so I'm going to read a piece called 38, which maybe you will feel, I'm hoping, both of those, um, both of those conditions, the idea of resistance, but the idea of belonging <clears throat> as well. I'm gonna, oh, I, I just got a cold. Let me have some water. Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to warn you that <clears throat> this piece is a longer piece. It's probably the longest piece in the book. It takes about 13 or 14 minutes to read. Um, I've only read this a couple times publicly. And the very first time I read this, I looked out and there were all these graduate student, students uh, falling asleep. So <laughs> I was, it like kind of uh, scared me and I didn't read it for a long time. So if you have to sleep, it's okay, but just letting you know. Thirty-eight. Here, the sentence will be respected. I will compose each sentence with care by minding what the rules of writing dictate. For example, all sentences will begin with capital letters. Likewise, <clears throat> The history of the sentence will be honored by ending each one with appropriate punctuation, such as a period or question mark, thus bringing the idea to momentary completion. You may like to know, I do not consider this a, quote, creative piece. <clears throat> I do not regard this as a poem of great imagination or a work of fiction. Also, historical events will not be dramatized for an interesting read. Therefore, I feel most responsible to the orderly sentence, conveyor of thought. <clears throat> that said, I will begin. You may or may not have heard about the Dakota 38. If this is the first time you've heard of it, you might wonder, what is the Dakota 38? The Dakota 38 refers to 38 Dakota men who were executed by hanging under orders from President Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> Today, 
to date, this is the largest legal mass execution in U.S. history. The hanging took place on December 26th, 1862, the day after Christmas. <laughs> this was the same week that President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. In the preceding sentence, I italicize same week for emphasis. There was a movie titled Lincoln about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. The signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was included in the film Lincoln. The hanging of the Dakota 38 was not. In any case, you might be asking, why were 30 Dakota men hung? Excuse me, why were 38 Dakota men hung? As a side note, the past tense of hang is hung. But when referring to the capital punishment of hanging, the correct past tense is hanged. So it's possible that you're asking, why were 38 Dakota men hanged? I want to tell you about the Sioux upright, excuse me, they were hanged for the Sioux uprising. I want to tell you about the Sioux uprising, but I don't know where to begin. I may jump around and details will not unfold in chronological order. Keep in mind, I am not a historian. <clears throat> so I will recount facts as best I can, given limited resources and understanding. Before Minnesota was a state, <clears throat> The Minnesota region, generally speaking, was the traditional homeland for Dakota, Anishinaabe, and Ho-Chunk people. Do we have any Dakota, Anishinaabe, or Ho-Chunk people here? Just wondering. Okay, oh well. <laughs> Just curious. During the 1800s, when the U.S. expanded territory, they purchased land from the Dakota people as well as the other tribes. But another way to understand that sort of, quote, purchase is Dakota leaders ceded land to the U.S. government in exchange for money or goods but most importantly, the safety of their people. Some say that Dakota leaders did not understand the terms they were entering, or they never would have agreed. Even others call the entire negotiation trickery. But to make whatever it was official and binding, the U.S. government drew up an initial treaty. <clears throat> this treaty was later replaced by another more convenient treaty, and then another. I've had difficulty <clears throat> understanding the terms of these treaties. 
Have you guys ever tried to read these treaties? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Given the legal speak and congressional language. As treaties were abrogated or broken, and new treaties were drafted, one after another, the new treaties were off the new treaties often referenced old defunct treaties, and it is a muddy switchback trail to follow. <clears throat> Although I often feel lost on this trail, I know I am not alone. However, as best as I can put the facts together, in 1851, Dakota Territory was contained to a 12-mile by 150-mile long strip along the Minnesota River. But just seven years later, in 1858, the northern portion was ceded, or taken, and the southern portion was conveniently allotted, which reduced Dakota land to a stark 10-mile tract. <clears throat> These amended and broken treaties are often referred to as the Minnesota Treaties. The word Minnesota comes from mini, which means water, and sota, which means turbid. Synonyms for turbid include muddy, unclear, cloudy, confused, and smoky. Everything is in the language we use. For example, a treaty is essentially a contract between two sovereign nations. The U.S. treaties with the Dakota Nation were legal contracts that promised money. <clears throat> it could be said this money was payment for the land the Dakota ceded, for living within assigned boundaries or a reservation and for relinquishing rights to their vast hunting territory, which in turn made Dakota people dependent on other means to survive, money. The previous sentence is circular, akin to so many aspects of history. As you may have guessed by now, the money promised in the turbid treaties did not make it into the hands of Dakota people. I just, uh, I'm forgetting the name now. I just uh, watched this uh, really incredible inter interview online with a Dakota man who, um, whose grandfather was a part of this history and talked about this period of um, resistance and starvation. I'll get to that, but um, <clears throat> there are still elders who carry these stories. It's not far away, this history. In addition, let's see. In addition, local government traders would not offer credit to quote Indians to purchase food or goods. Without money, store credit, or rights to hunt beyond their 10-mile tract of land, Dakota people began to starve. The Dakota people were starving. The Dakota people starved. In the preceding sentence, the word starved does not need italics 
for emphasis. One should read the Dakota people starved as a straightforward and plainly stated fact. As a result, and without other options but to continue to starve, Dakota people retaliated. Dakota warriors organized, struck out, and killed settlers and traders. This revolt is called the Sioux Uprising. Now you have your history lesson. <laughs> if somebody mentions that, you'll know what that was all about. <clears throat> Eventually, the U.S. Cavalry came to Minnesota and confronted the uprising. More than 1,000 Dakota people were sent to prison. As already mentioned, 38 Dakota men were subsequently hanged. After the hanging, those 1,000 Dakota prisoners were released. However, as further consequence, what remained of Dakota territory in Minnesota was dissolved or taken. The Dakota people had no land to return to. This means they were exiled. Homeless, the Dakota people of Minnesota were relocated or forced onto reservations in South Dakota and Nebraska. Now every year, a group called the Dakota 38 plus two riders conduct a memorial horse ride from Lower Brule, South Dakota to Mankato, Minnesota. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to see something really beautiful too, you, sh you might check out YouTube videos of this ride, Dakota uh, 38 riders. Um, it's really beautiful and maybe hear the story of the man who started this memorial ride. Um, in any case, the memorial riders travel 325 miles on horseback for 18 days, sometimes through sub-zero blizzards. They conclude their journey on December 26th, the day of the hanging. Memorials help focus our memory on particular people or events. Often, memori <clears throat> excuse me, memorials come in the forms of plaques, statues, or gravestones. The memorial for the Dakota 38 is not an object inscribed with words but an act. Yet, <clears throat> yet, I started this piece because I was interested in writing about grasses. So there is one other event to include. Although it's not in chronological order, and we must backtrack a little. <clears throat> when the Dakota people were starving, as you may remember, government traders would not extend store credit to Indians. One trader named Andrew Myrick is famous for his refusal to provide credit to Dakota people by saying, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. 
There are variations of Myrick's words, but they are all something to that effect. When settlers and traders were killed during the Sioux uprising, one of the first to be executed by the Dakota was Andrew Myrick. When Myrick when Myrick's body was found, his mouth was stuffed with grass. I am inclined to call this act by the Dakota warriors a poem. There's irony in their poem. There was no text. Real poems do not really require words. I have italicized the previous sentence to indicate inner dialogue, a revealing moment. But on second thought, the words, let them eat grass, click the gears of the poem into place. So, we could also say, language and word choice are critical to the poem's work. Things are circling back again. Sometimes when in a circle, if I wish to exit, I must leap. And let the body swing from the platform out to the grasses. Thank you. You guys are so nice. I don't think anybody fell asleep during that reading. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to read, how, how are we doing on time? I'm just going to read a few more pieces. I'm going to read just a few pieces from um, the second section of my book, which is um, the title of the book, Whereas. And that second section is a response to the National Apology to Native Americans, uh, signed by Obama in December 2009. Um, when he signed that apology, um, he did it on a Saturday um, at his desk, and no tribal leaders were invited to witness that signing or receive this apology on behalf of their tribal nations. Um, there was a senator, a Senator Brownback, who read that apology aloud, and there was no public reading. Um, Senator Brownback read that uh, apology five months later, but to a gathering of five tribal leaders. There are over, how many of you know how many federally recognized tribes there are? I'm quizzing you. <laughs> What's that? Over 200? Over yes, there are actually over 560. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. So uh, if I want to be just brutal and honest, when people say, oh, uh, where are all the Native people? There are, no, uh, there are no Native people. You are surrounded by tribal people. There are over 560 uh, tribes in the U.S., and those are just the recognized ones, and there are others who are working towards recognition. 
So uh, he read to five tribal leaders. <clears throat> In any case, I wrote a response to that apology, both to the delivery but also to the language found in that document. Um, that apology is online. All of you can um, look at it if you want to. And I have to say, I'm also suddenly very hungry and my tummy's growling. So if you hear my stomach, <laughs> I was like, oh no. Whereas, I did not desire in childhood to be a part of this, but desired most of all to be a part, a piece combined with others to make up a whole, some but not all of something. In Lakota, it's hanke a piece or part of anything. Like the creek trickling behind my auntie's house, where uncle built her a bridge to cross from bank to bank, not far from a grassy clearing with three teepees, a place to gather. She holds three-day workshops on traditional arts, Young people from Kyle and Potato Creek arrive one by one, eager to participate. They have the option, my auntie says, to sleep at home and return in the morning. But by and large, they'll stay and camp, even during South Dakota winters. The comfort of being together. I think of plains winds, snow drifts, ice and limbs, the exposure, and when I slide my arms into a wool coat and put my hand to the doorknob, ready to brave the sub-zero dark, someone says, be careful out there. Always consider the snow your friend. Think badly of it, snow will burn you. I walk out remembering that for millennia we have called ourselves Lakota, meaning friend or ally. This relationship to the other, some but not all, still our peace to everything. <clears throat> Whereas, um, actually, I'm going to read this uh, piece and just say, I would consider this piece the heart, the heart of this whole book. <clears throat> and it's a meditation on the most effective apology I've had in my whole life. So this was a moment with my dad. Whereas, I heard a noise I thought was a sneeze. At the breakfast table, pushing eggs around my plate, I wondered if he liked my cooking, thought about what to talk about. He pinched his fingers to the bridge of his nose, squeezed his eyes. He wiped. I often say he was a terrible drinker, when I was a child. I'm not afraid to say it because he's different now. Sober, attentive, showered, eating. But in my childhood, when things were different, I rolled onto my side, my hands together as if to pray. 
um, locked between my knees. When things were different, I lay there for long hours, my face to the wall, blank. My eyes left me, my soldiers, my two scouts to the unseen. And because language is the immaterial, I never could speak about the missing. So perhaps I cried for the invisible, what I could not see doubly. What is it to wish for the absence of nothing? There at the breakfast table as an adult, wondering what to talk about if he liked my cooking, pushing the invisible to the plate's edge. I looked up to see he hadn't sneezed. He was crying. I'd never heard him cry, didn't recognize the symptoms. I turned to him when I heard him say, I'm sorry I wasn't there. Sorry for many things. Like that, curative voicing. (coughs) Excuse me, my cold, sorry. Like that, curative voicing, an opened bundle, or medicine, or birthday wishing. My hand to his shoulder, It's okay, I said, it's over now. I meant it because of our faces blankly, because of a lifelong stare down, because of centuries in sorry. I'm just going to conclude with this piece, which is a piece I I usually end with. It's a resolution to, I have 20 whereas statements, seven resolutions, and two disclaimers, which uh, follows the structure of the national apology. So this is uh, the second resolution, and it uses text directly from the, um, the document, the national document itself. <clears throat> I commend this land and this land. Honor this land. Native this land. Peoples this land. For this land, the, this land, thousands, this land, of this land, Years, this land, that, this land, they, this land, have, this land, stewarded this 
land. And this land <clears throat> protected this land, this land, this land, this land, this land, this land, this, this. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, so much for the act of the poem and the poem of the act and for belonging with us. All right. Um, Lily will be signing books if you want to go look at one, actually buy one um, and talk to the poet for a little while. Thank you for being here. Come back in November for Salma Sharif. Thank you. Thank you.